Today's chapter is going to be on new and re-emerging infectious diseases. Let's again uh, try to define these terms. Infectious diseases with an incidence in humans that have increased in the past 30 years or threatened to increase in the near future, we tend to term new and re-emerging infections. Now, new infectious diseases that have come about in that, roughly in that time period, would include HIV, AIDS, SARS, Lyme's disease, Nipah virus, uh, influenza, H5N1 or H1N1. Infectious diseases, uh, however, uh, oftentimes emerge in new places, and they are sometimes called re-emerging diseases. This would be uh, diseases such as West Nile virus and monkeypox. Then there are diseases that re-emerge in drug-resistant forms, uh, a particularly worrisome group which includes uh, malaria, a multiple uh, drug-resistant tuberculosis, and some bacterial pneumonias and sexually transmitted diseases. Now there are a number of factors that have contributed to the uh, arising of new and re-emerging infectious diseases. These might include increased population density, inadequate infrastructures for water and sanitation, movements of people through travel and social disruption, the centralized production of food and its distribution, environmental changes, uh, misuse and overuse of antibiotics and other drugs, changes in human behavior, and sometimes dysfunctional governments. Let's look at some of these in greater detail. In terms of the increase in population, uh, it was estimated that the population in 2000 was about 6.1 billion people, and by 2050, this will come clo become close to doubling to 9.4 or 11.2 billion people. We're also seeing a tremendous increase in urbanization, going from 47% uh, in 2000 uh, to 60% to 65%, increasing urbanization of the global population. Now, as the population of the world increases, of course, there are going to be uh, greater uh, contacts between humans and wildlife in, uh, in uh, habitats that normally we don't uh, venture into. And because of this interaction uh, with both humans and our animals, uh, we may see uh, the rise of uh, new uh, viruses. The coverage of water supply, particularly in least developed uh, countries, is also very problematic, particularly uh, in both urban and rural areas in least developed countries. Uh, the percentage that have access to potable water uh, is uh, uh, anywhere from 50 to uh, 60 percent. Most of the drawing of water in rural areas uh, and in urban areas uh, is work of women. That is, they are the ones who are doing all the work of, of getting it from wells, uh, from rivers, and so on, and taking that water back to their home. This is assuming that there is not an indoor water tap. And in this uh, bringing of water into urban areas through trucks and so on, where people are then forced to come to this uh, area, collect the water, take it back to their home, is another way of distributing, but it's also very problematic as uh, that source could be contaminated, as well as the buckets and vessels which carry the water back to the home could also uh, uh, be contaminated. It also limits the amount of water that's oftentimes available. The disposal of human waste is an increasing problem. The privies uh, are directly uh, linked to a body of water which connects to other parts of the city, and that uh, 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 that fecal uh, uh, disposal is, of course, quite unsatisfactory. Uh, we are increasingly discovering that uh, uh, open defecation may well be linked to uh, undernutrition in children where this is a broad problem. The increase in travel, both internationally and locally, also uh, uh, provides opportunities for diseases to move about. We can move Ebola from one country to another in a matter of a few hours uh, by air, and we have seen this 
this happen. No place in the world is unconnected to any other. We are really, truly a global village. The production of food on an industrial basis has allowed for increasing uh, availability of food, both grains and meat, but has also uh, intensified the use of antibiotics and the raising of animals. And where a central food supply is contaminated, that contaminated food then uh, travels far and wide. It's not the same as getting milk from your local farmer or uh, buying vegetables at the local farmer's market. When we uh, buy vegetables and fruits in many of our uh, large cities of the world, we have no idea where this comes from. Here's the production of chickens uh, in an uh, industrialized production where thousands upon thousands of chickens are grown together uh, in oftentimes extremely uh, uh, inhumane uh, circumstances where they have no mo movement and so on. One can uh, uh, see that where a disease would enter this population, it would destroy many, many chickens in a short period of time. This is, of course, quite different than what takes place oftentimes in local areas where there may be one purveyor of chickens from uh, a few uh, individuals in the community. Where ecology is involved is, of course, in climate changes, uh, where uh, temperatures have increased in certain areas, which have allowed for the introduction of mosquitoes, for example, that had not been there in the past. Uh, the tires uh, are, are often uh, traded internationally, but when one trades in tires, there's oftentimes water uh, that is in the bottom of the tire, and those, that water will uh, you don't need much to set up a breeding ground for mosquitoes. Those mosquitoes can then carry the viruses from where they came from to where they're going. And then the uh, misuse of and overuse of antibiotics has led to the development of uh, antibiotic resistance. We have only had antibiotics, really, for about 70 years. A blink in the eye in terms of, uh, of evolution. Uh, and yet, we have managed to create a number of uh, organisms that are extremely difficult to treat and far more expensive to treat. For example, multiple drug-resistant tuberculosis is much more expensive to treat than is uh, uh, regular tuberculosis. Artemidocin, which is the last, uh, the latest uh, drug we have to treat malaria, the last in the line, uh, resistance is developing to that. Even though we treat uh, these uh, malaria now with three drugs to try to avoid uh, resistance to artemidocin. Uh, tetracycline for cholera, multiple drug resistant gonorrhea, which is a, a problem, and in our hospitals, multiple drug resistant staphylococci, which can infect wounds and cause devastating diseases. I would now like to focus on one particular new disease uh, that has uh, taken the world by storm over the last 30 plus years, and that's HIV, uh, which leads to AIDS. One might ask, where did HIV come from? It most likely came from uh, uh, somewhere in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, there is a, uh, an infection in some of the great apes called a simian immune deficiency virus. It might well have been that uh, someone in the forest or in a market was skinning a, uh, a chimpanzee or uh, a related species and cut themselves with a knife that carried the blood of this uh, animal and therefore infected themselves. And unfortunately, this virus adapted itself to humans. Uh, it then spread from that person through sex most likely, but it could have been through other means, uh, to another person and so on, until there was a critical mass of individuals who were infected uh, and then the epidemic gradually increased uh, and then of course spread uh, globally over time. We don't know the initial events, but it would seem to be that this was a zoonosis where the organism adapted itself uh, uh, very effectively to human beings. The distribution of HIV, even though it uh, came upon the world within probably five or six years that it, it had been uh, introduced everywhere, 
uh, you can see that the distribution is quite variable, with uh, uh, most cases occurring in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, and if one looks at the population to case ratio, it's even higher in that part of the world, which raises an interesting question. Why, though HIV uh, uh, appeared in the world, uh, in many parts of the world around the same time, why has the sp spread been heterogeneous, not only globally, but even with the epidemic in sub-Saharan Africa? And I'd like to explore, explore those ideas for just a moment to look at uh, why this might happen and what does it tell us about prevention of these conditions. Now, the spread of HIV in sub-Saharan Africa between 1984 and 1999 uh, was uh, uh, quite interesting because it, uh, uh, in 1984, it was fairly evenly distribu distributed. By 1999, this had become a disease much more in the very southern parts of Africa and eastern Africa. And West Africa, uh, in some parts, have remained somewhat unchanged. Senegal, uh, Mauritania, Niger, and so on. The dark red represents the highest prevalence of HIV. Now, there are certain risk factors, I'll call these proximal determinants, that are associated with HIV AIDS, the, the, getting of, the uh, obtaining of this infection. Clearly transfusion with contaminated bloods or contaminated needles and syringes, which is like a mini transfusion. Unprotected sex with a singer or particularly multiple partners uh, uh, can increase your risk substantially. Mother to child transmission through delivery and breastfeeding. And interestingly, uh, the non-circumcision of men in certain parts of the world. Let me uh, look at that last issue. Male circumcision, interestingly enough, is probably one of the oldest uh, forms of surgery going back to at least 22, 2300 years uh, before the Common Era, uh, as seen on this hieroglyphic uh, from ancient Egypt. The circumcision uh, rates in different countries in sub-Saharan Africa, you can see are quite different, with the highest uh, level of, of uh, AIDS in those countries which have the lowest level of male circumcision. Now, why, why should male circumcision uh, protect one? Well, it turns out that the inner lining of the foreskin contains cells which have a particular avidity uh, for the HIV virus, as well as the human papillomavirus, which is associated with cervical cancer. Also, when one removes the foreskin, uh, the uh, skin underneath uh, uh, hardens a bit uh, and is more impenetrable, uh, probably, to the virus itself. So there are biological reasons for why uh, this uh, particular simple operation uh, reduces risks. We should remember that the uh, initiation or the institution of, of male circumcision, which, by the way, has nothing to do with female circumcision, uh, was related to tribal or religious identity. It was not initiated initially to as any type of health measure. And certainly, uh, we didn't know about these issues uh, uh, hundreds of years ago uh, when uh, these uh, practices were introduced. Now, distal determinants, that is, those factors that uh, affect the proximal determinants, would be socioeconomic conditions, domestic violence, the status of women, uh, the degree and type of migrant labor, sexual practices and values as defined by culture. And we have to be very careful that we don't uh, associate practices and values with any kind of ethical or moral uh, uh, character of the individuals involved. Uh, they have their antecedents in other, uh, in other issues. And then concurrent partnerships, this is having uh, many partners over a week as to have the, having those many partners uh, serially over the course of a year. Now, what strategies then can we use based on these risk factors uh, to reduce the uh, possible risk for HIV? Well, if we delay the age of sexual debut, that is when 
uh, uh, adolescents begin to have sex, we clearly reduce the time when they're going to be exposed, as we would by reducing the number and the exposure to high-risk partners. Uh, if we reduce the degree of concurrency, that would also reduce risk. If we limit alcohol and drug use prior to sex, we, re we uh, make sure that the inhibitions to using condoms, for example, uh, are not taken away. We can increase the level of male circumcision where the rates of HIV are very high, uh, and uh, this would be, again, uh, very much in southern Africa, but not in, uh, in, in East Africa, but not in many other parts of the world. Uh, we could presumptively treat some sexually transmitted uh, diseases to reduce uh, transmission uh, and certainly test the blood supply and needle exchange and syringes uh, for IV drug users. Um, one could also uh, treat individuals who are HIV positive uh, and uh, thereby limit the transmission of this to their partners. This is problematic, however, uh, and is uh, not as easy to implement. If one looks at this uh, uh, schema of the uh, HIV infection, one will notice that the first uh, few weeks, months, is when we have the highest level of viral particles in our blood, viremia. It is during that period of time when one is most uh, uh, likely to transmit the infection. So if one has an, a number of partners during that time, has sex shortly after one is infected, you are uh, more likely to transmit the infection than when you enter the uh, asymptomatic period uh, which can go on for a number of years. Now we can measure uh, the uh, viral load in blood and we can also look at uh, other associated factors such as the CD4 count but it's that those first few uh, weeks, months maybe, that uh, when we are most likely to transmit uh, the infection because we don't know we're infected. There is no way of telling other than to do frequent HIV uh, tests, which is uh, somewhat impractical. We can also reduce the risk of infection post-exposure. That is, someone is exposed, we can give nevaroprine for uh, the transmission, uh, to reduce the transmission of mother to child. We can treat uh, with ARVs, as I noted, post-exposure, or even give it prophylactically, especially to high-risk groups, uh, uh, people who have multiple partners, for example. Uh, the use of vaginal microbicides has also been recommended. But these are the uh, factors that you can do post-exposure. Clearly, it's far more practical if we can prevent the infection uh, uh, to begin with. Well, what I've tried to do uh, in, the, uh, in this brief uh, uh, chapter is to look at new and re-emerging infectious diseases. Uh, why they occur, what are the risk factors in the modern day world. I've then focused on HIV AIDS uh, as an example of a new and uh, a re-emerging disease.